Colonel, Colonel, thank you very much for your briefing. And now I give the floor to Ms. Coral Pasisi. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity uh, to brief this important high-level debate. For over a decade, every year in the annual communique, Pacific Island Forum leaders have been stating that climate change presents the single greatest threat to the Pacific region and our security. There are many reasons for this, but in the interest of time today, I will only highlight three examples. Firstly is the threat to our maritime boundaries. The Pacific Island region is a blue continent, 98% ocean in nature. Our collective exclusive economic zones comprise 28 million square kilometers of the globe and more than 20% of the world's EEZs. Both collectively and individually, our economies, environments, people and security are intricately linked to our ocean and the certainty around which we can sustainably manage and benefit from these ocean resources both now and into the future. UNCLOS established a comprehensive legal order for the ocean, providing a regime for certain you stable and durable maritime zone designations and associated rights, duties and economic returns. However, UNCLOS did not foresee climate change or its impacts. As a result, many maritime boundaries of states around the world may be affected by the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. Pacific SIDS are amongst the most affected for the following reasons. For many of our island countries, particularly the low-lying atolls, the base points used to demarcate maritime boundaries consist of coral islands and sandy keys. These are vulnerable to climate change and due sea level rise, ocean acidification and degrading coral reef systems. The Pacific is also home to the majority of low-lying low atoll nations in the world. Four of our low-lying atoll nations have between 90 and 100 percent of their EEZs demarcated based on these vulnerable baseline features. This could have significant consequences for statehood, national identity, sustainable development, livelihoods and law and order in the Pacific. There can be no greater threat to our security than the potential loss of one's entire nation and its jurisdictions as established under international law. The magnitude of this security challenge underpins the priority Pacific leaders have placed on registering maritime boundaries as a matter of great urgency. The more, the more recently, um, they are also seeking progressive legal options to ensure that once fixed in accordance with UNCLOS, these, uh, these cannot be challenged um, as a result of climate change and sea level rise impacts. This is a highly technical and resource intensive exercise being undertaken by Pacific Island countries themselves. And this work is being assisted by a consortium of partners in the region uh, over the last 10 years, which has been led by the Pacific community, supported by the Pacific Islands Forum Secretary at the Forum Fisheries Agencies and funded by Australia, New Zealand and other partners. Secondly is the threat to the blue economy. And I will focus on tuna fisheries in this instance. Fisheries and tourism revenue derived from a healthy ocean environment underpin the economic development, social security, uh, sustainable development and health of most of our Pacific Island countries. Climate change threatens to, de to permanently de degrade and destabilize a massive portion of coral reefs, ocean ecosystems and the key species we are highly dependent upon. Given the time, I'll only focus on tuna as an example. The Western and Central the Pacific Ocean is home to over half the world's tuna stocks. It provides one third of global tuna supply and several SIDS in the Pacific are highly dependent on tuna. Nine Pacific SIDS derive an average of between 10 and 84 percent of all government revenue from tuna fishing license fees. It employs about six to eight percent of the workforce and a high number of that are women. Within 15 years, 25% of all fish required for food security of Pacific Island people will need to come from tuna. Climate change is projected to alter the migratory patterns of tuna, moving them further eastwards and up into the high seas. It will also impact on the fish stock numbers and their health. The latest preliminary modeling and economic analysis underway indicates that 20% of the combined tuna catch currently harvested from 
the EEZs of Pacific SIDS will shift into the high seas by 2050 under RCP 8.5 emission scenario. This represents 90 million per annum in lost access revenues for all Pacific um, SIDS combined by 2050 and losses of up to 10 to 15 percent in total government revenue for several countries. These impacts could also weaken the existing compliance and enforcement arrangements by increasing the potential for illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing as monitoring and imposition of penalties is more difficult on the high seas. If left unaddressed, the consequences of these threats could catalyze conflict and instability in island countries and economies. And thirdly, the threats posed by displacement and forced migration. Long before lands disappear beneath the ocean, it will become so degraded and unproductive due to saltwater intrusion, coastal erosion and coral reef degradation. In the absence of ambition, ambitious mitigation and, and adaptations, this may force the displacement and migration of thousands of people and cause huge loss and damage. Close to 60% of our populations live within one kilometer of the ocean. And this and um, the displacement is already affecting a number of Pacific SIDS and communities in our region. Some examples include the resettlement within states, Papua New Guinea, of inhabitants from Cataract and other atolls to Bougainville and between islands. Climate change migrants from Tuvalu have been coming to my own country, Niue, over the last 10 years or so. The fact that such changes undermine complex and often contested traditional land tenure systems and limited land resources increases the potential for conflict and fragility. There remains a great dearth in protection, policies, resources and information on the status of these situations in the region and how we can effectively manage um, this. Countries, communities and individuals have already and will continue to suffer great loss and damage both economic and non-economic. Some of our young people in particular stand to lose their inherent birthrights of culture and cultural and traditional practice in situ and potentially even their citizenship. These are irreplaceable losses. So what can the UN system and the UN Security Council in particular do to help? Without a doubt, the most important measure to reduce these threats to island countries in the Pacific and across the world is to stop climate change and to reverse it. Ambitious impl implementation of the Paris Agreement is essential. COVID-19, as awful as it is, represents an opportunity of reset, bringing to the fore the importance of healthy, connected and resilient societies. We cannot achieve these goals over the long term without collective climate action. Climate events may be delayed, but the climate emergency is not. This effort requires all of us to understand better and monitor the implications globally to people all around the world and to be willing to mount a coordinated response. For countries that have committed, have contributed so little to global warming but stand to lose so much, it seems a fair ask to have the highest multilateral body addressing security on earth, the UN Security Council, to take the time to understand the scenario and do everything in its power to address it build on and integrate the best available science modeling and risk assessments into your work. Coordinate with the many existing efforts in our region and others already underway across the development, climate change, disaster and humanitarian bodies of practice. Mobilize the necessary capacity and resources and use your power to rally global ambition to address this before it becomes a security issue and challenge that none of us can deal with. I thank you. I thank Ms. Pasisi for her briefing. And I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the Federal Minister for Foreign Affairs of Germany. Assistant Secretary General.